everybody. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I write and talk all about all different kinds of fitness and outdoor related activities, pretty much anything adventure, and I want to try it or talk about it. And I'm Peter Glassford. I am Molly's co-host. I am a registered kinesiologist and endurance coach. And yeah, we were just at a a course for a few days, but in between that we were camping, which we haven't done in a while. This is very, not very crazy camping for anyone who's a camping enthusiast. We'd love to have you on the show if you are one, by the way. But this was more camping in our little Ford Transit van, and, and we have a little tent as well if, if the weather conditions are great. They were not. We still opted to stay in the tent despite the fact that we knew it was going to pour rain and lightning, and so we, we dealt with that. But I think we, we survived. Nothing got super wet, and mm-hmm. we, we certainly didn't get wet overnight yeah, so good i job guess us. we survived car camping <laughs> <laughs> at a koa with heated washrooms <laughs> and beautiful showers yes. it's really roughing and it. all our possessions in the van beside so yeah. i mean the risk the risk was not high but uh, no. early wins they say but in two weeks the risk will be high because we're gonna hike the lacloche trail Yeah, so the time is coming here. So uh, at the course we actually unrelated to the course content we were actually lucky one of the the participants, fellow participants, was quite experienced with Killarney and hiking and stuff like that. So uh, throughout the course, I was able to pick his brain a little bit. And uh, apparently the bugs are going to be quite bad. So yeah, we're 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 going to get the sweet hats. We're going to have to get some Tilly hats and some stuff over top. So if anyone knows a lot about that, uh, yeah, we'd love to have you on the show. Even if you're, you know, you're just recreational and you've done it a bunch, you know, you're you're an expert in that field. So we'd honestly love to have you on. So uh, look us up and you can do you know we have a form if you have ideas for anything but uh, you can go to consummateathlete.com and there's like a contact page um and that's probably the best way to get a hold of us yeah. or, or tw- twitter or facebook too yeah i was just thinking i'm excited because this time next week i get to change my intro a little bit to uh yeah molly the bike racer uh, no actually i yeah, was which gonna hat go are with... you gonna wear next next well, week next... I, I can't keep track of which hat you're wearing next week is pre-bike racing but i'll be an official yoga instructor and i uh... certified one with the yoga alliance because i'm finally almost done with my yoga teacher training well that'll be relaxing yeah yeah i'd say i'll get my weekends back but actually right after that the week after that i'll be able to say i'm a bike racer again because i'll head right to killington for a killington stage race right so in consummate athlete form molly's going to try and transition uh, from (laughs) yoga training almost solely to a road stage race next weekend so we'll be able to hear how that that goes we've been getting a little bit of preparation in but uh hey we're going to have to rely a little bit on Molly's past experiences, I think, on this. Um, but, I mean, maybe the yoga will help. You've been able to endure long durations of, of class and, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, holding those yoga postures. You'll certainly be supple. I guess. So hinged forward that I'm, like, on my top tube. Well, I mean, I think there's transfer there, right? There's a, if you look at sort of the common things that really derail people, I mean, fitness is obviously one, but, you know, things like, you know, getting knee pain, back pain, that sort of stuff. So, I mean, you, you might be okay. And yeah. if, if you have, if you're on top of your nutrition, mm. then that's obviously a big part. And that's, you know, as we get into season here, that's actually what a lot of, you know, phone consults I'm doing or, or just sort of talking to clients, you know, working through any niggles or, or, you know, missteps we're having with nutrition off the bike. And then also, you know, everyone's always concerned about race day nutrition. Um, and usually that sort of traces back to we have to, stop doing crazy things on race day, in my opinion, and and sort of think about that every day, you know, training nutrition and off-bike nutrition. Um, But today we have... Stacey Sims. And so Stacey is an expert in uh, all things nutrition, I think, but especially for women and especially in extreme conditions, which we talk a lot about today. So anyone who's thinking about altitude tents and going to altitude for races like Leadville, um, or you're going to be racing in summer heat, which is a lot of us, hopefully, now that we're out of the depths of winter. Stacy is very well versed. Um, we go through a bit of her her sort of Paul Mare is in the educational field, but she is, you know, well-rounded as an athlete and then also just has so many degrees and so many studies she's done and so many, she's got books, um, Roar we talk about. Um, yeah, and if you guys remember, that was the Athletic Bookworms read back in January. So you can see there's some, like, reviews and stuff that you've posted yes. on theoutdooredit.com. Yes, a lot of takeaways from the book over there that we don't necessarily get into in this podcast because I didn't want to just rehash 
a lot of the stuff that we'd already talked about. And I had a lot of questions. You did have a lot of questions. And I mean, I think we really wanted to make sure we kind of backed out and, you know, we talk a bunch about women specific stuff. We also wanted to talk about, you know, heat and altitude for everybody, not just for the female population. Right. The reality is there's a lot of crossover, right? But we get talking about things like how the, the period, the menstrual cycle, how that uh, influences Are you training. just really proud that you can say a menstrual cycle? Sometimes I worry I'm not saying it right, so I do pause there, and I do I do apologize, but I'm I'm working on that. Um, but we we talk about how that you know there's some myths around that, there's some misconceptions around that. Uh, you know what are the effects of that? Is there effects? You know are there effects for everyone? You know even if you're not getting you know really bad cramps or something, right? And so we talk about sort of how to deal with that and and best sort of actions for coaches. You know, we talk about the communication around topics like that. Uh, And then also just general, like when you're going to altitude for anyone, you know, what do we consider? How do we best adapt? How do we adapt when, you know, you can't go there for a month beforehand? Uh, We talk about altitude tents. We talk about getting ready for heat. We talk about using heat to get ready for altitude. Um, And then we talk about just some general nutrition stuff as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, training nutrition. So, I think this is an amazing, I, I had a blast with it. I yeah, really Stacey is one of my favorite people to interview. She has so much information, just like right off the bat, you can ask. And she'll yeah. be like, oh yeah, there was a Super study impressive. done. <laughs> yeah, but very casual. Like she is, it's not like very scientific. You don't feel like you're in a lecture, right? But uh, yeah, a really, really good mix of sort of practical and, you know, very casual, but then very well researched as well. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is that pretty much all we have as far as updates for for folks. I think so. Shred right. girls caps are you know, there's still a couple available, but uh, almost out of those limited edition caps. Yep, you can get them at shred-girls.com. All right, let's dive in. Enjoy the podcast with Stacey Sims. So, over the years you've worked, you know, you've mentioned all your academic stuff, and then you've also worked for or with or founded um i mean you founded your own company osmo right and then but you've also worked with like Mm -hmm. cliff bar and usa cycling and some pro tour teams so i mean you've sort of seen the spectrum um you know Mm -hmm. as far as businesses and athletes and people trying to come you know to terms with nutrition um you know is that what what type of people are you working with you know these days like are you still in the lab you know putting people through heat stress tests and stuff or what what sort of a day right now look like for you <laughs> well i look on my board and i have 12 different projects going and they all are very diverse i'm working um with marine sciences um as a passing comment that i had with the head of marine sciences whose daughter zoe is very interested in some of the stuff I do with female athlete health. And the passing comment was, you know, we could look to harness some of the marine peptides for protein because there was this big push for environmental sustainability and the government here in New Zealand is trying to find ways to make things more sustainable here because of the cost of living. And he's like, oh, that's a very interesting idea. So I wrote up a summer project to look at um, seaweed. And the protein content in seaweed can vary depending on water temperature and the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the water and that kind of stuff. But you can have a really good high leucine content in certain species. So I just we had learned summer- about this, actually. I was just writing yeah. a bunch about like fresh spirulina and the leucine content compared to like spinach or anything else is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Because um, because of the variability of sunlight and water temperature, it needs to have the protein accessibility to survive. And you can kill two-thirds, well, I shouldn't say kill, but you can take two-thirds of the plant and it will still survive and flourish. So looking from a sustainability point of view, we've identified three different New Zealand native seaweed species that have the same amino acid profile as whey protein. So towards the end of the year, we're putting it into um, athletes to look at muscle protein synthesis and the um, differences between using the seaweed versus the whey protein. Um, And if you're thinking about muscle mechanics and it's all about leucine content and some of the other amino acid availability, um, the only concern would be what is the actual bioavailability when you take it from the seaweed and put it into a supplement form. Um, so those are some of the things we're working on, but then the long-term, you know, I guess not necessarily consequences, but the long-term effect of having something like the seaweed is 
if you're vegan or lactose intolerant or like the New Zealand government is saying, oh, we have too many cows, we need to get rid of them because of the methane and the affluent that gets into the river and all this kind of stuff. It's like, okay, well, here's a sustainable source. And then people who can't eat because they have a muscle wasting disease or they have catachia from cancer, then there's the availability of ingesting something that's going to help to keep that lean mass development going. Um, so that's, you know, the one side of product development. And then I have different things going in with heat and looking at um, the lead up to Tokyo. So I'm working with the professional teams that are based here. And we have a couple of PhD students that are looking at involving heat exposure throughout the training to see if we can get increased training adaptations as well as make heat a moot point when they get off the plane for Tokyo. Um, and then I'm doing a lot of um, stuff in the female athlete space, looking at relative energy deficiency, um, changing training and nutrition in women based on menstrual cycle to improve adaptations and um, prevent them from getting uh, into low energy availability and endocrine dysfunction. Um, so all trying to improve the health of the athlete instead of thinking about all the pathophysiological aspects that you have with female athletes. Oh, that's awesome. I have to ask. So I'm so just, every day is varied. <laughs> yeah. I've been through the book writing process. And I mean, you came out with Roar probably almost over a year ago now, right? When did that come 2016, out? 2016, uh, towards the end of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, me, yeah. 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 I mean, since writing that, I mean, I had this with Feel Your Ride. Is there anything you wish you'd been able to, like, could you go back and like add a chapter? Like, is there anything that you've found since it came out that you're like, oh, would love to do something oh, yeah. on that? <laughs> yeah. I want to put out a second edition to change some of the heat and the, um, the heat stuff because we found that women need a primer before you do heat adaptation because of this variation in the menstrual cycle where the second half, all your thresholds shift due to an increased core temperature. So women actually need a primer of heat exposure before they actually go into a sauna or something to get that adaptation. So trying to explain that, um, looking at the gut microbiome, there's been so much science that's come out in the past year about the gut microbiome mm -hmm. and how, you know, an uh, elite athlete could still have the same kind of biome as a, a sedentary person depending on their training diet. So there's lots of different things I'd like to like, change up and then expand on the um, masters and menopausal section as well because there's been a lot more stuff that's come out since then. Yeah, so. that's... Yeah. Or write a whole new book. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I, I'll say it in the intro. I'll say it here. Like, I loved Roar. I thought it was one of the, the best books on women's sport that I've read. I mean, ever, really. So, yeah. You, know, you know that. Thanks. I loved it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I've just made it mandatory reading for the nutrition class I have to teach next semester. Nice. <laughs> like, no one's talking about this stuff. We have a a working group with High Performance Sport New Zealand called WISPA, and it's Women in Sport and Health Performance Advantage. So it's talking about all this stuff, but it's it's the clinicians, it's the sociologists, it's the physiologists, it's the um, high performance sport providers. It's all of us together that are sitting around the table and talking about all the different aspects of it. And then we come together and we're like, okay, well, this is what needs to be disseminated. Um, so we're trying to find ways to you know push those things out as well. And it's interesting when you get all of those people around the room, different different ideas and angles, and then trying to make everyone coalesce into one. Um, so there's been lots of interesting discussions about all of that. Well, you have me. I'm just overwhelmed with the number of it's things true. I want to ask right now. But uh, I wonder if you could go through, you know, we have listeners who are coaches, um, you know, and working with young females and, and older females, um, and then just working with sort of general population, you know, of racers who are coming into, you know, a hot period of time, and then also altitude uh, based races like Leadville and things like that. So I'm wondering if you could talk first about sort of just the basics of uh, heat adaptation, sort of what someone, you know, especially... Uh, I guess a master's athlete, but what someone can do to get ready, you know, if they're not, you know, an Olympian and have all these resources, like what are some basics if you're going to go to some really, really hot race, um, you know, and we're just sort of in springtime or, or, you know, not as hot a place right now? Yeah. Um, so what you're really looking when you're trying to adapt to the heat are some of the, what we call cardiovascular adaptations. So that means that you'll vasodilate and then um, your sweat 
will come sooner and will be more dilute and you'll be able to carry more blood so you have a greater blood volume and all of these things can come with just very small doses of heat exposure. And what I mean by that is after you finish training, you can go into the sauna or a spa um, and just get that passive heat exposure for about 30 minutes when you're somewhat dehydrated from training. And all of that, if you do that seven to nine days in a row, is going to instigate all of these changes you want to be able to cope with the heat when you're racing. Um, if you don't have the accessibility of a spa or a sauna, um, it does become a little bit more difficult. You can look to go to your race venue just a few days earlier, do a couple of really short, high-intensity um exposures in the middle of the day so your body's like whoa what is going on and then um, not have air conditioning during the day but sleep with air conditioning at night because the small little primer is going to help you cope more with the heat when race day comes if you're looking at um like young athletes who might be going to heat as well, it depends on when puberty hits because before puberty, kids have a very hard time coping with the heat. They don't sweat. They just vasodilate, so they're trying to offload heat just through um, convection or wind flow and that kind of stuff. And they might start to sweat at very late stages. And they also don't feel very thirsty, so you have to encourage them to drink. So the way that you can kind of help with that is, again, having small doses of heat exposure, but also knowing that they can't tolerate the heat as well as someone who's gone through puberty. So you have to have very short bouts of exposure and then make sure that you keep them really well hydrated. So it could be, you know, five or ten minutes of really hot playing time then bring them back inside and cool them down and then maybe a couple hours later do it again. So they're getting those small doses, but they're not overtaxing the body. And as soon as you hit puberty and you have estrogen and testosterone and progesterone that come into play, this is where you start having threshold changes and you start seeing a couple of sex differences. And this is where, like, women need a primer before they do any kind of um, proper heat acclimation work and then can just go straight into a sauna or hot session. Um, Yeah, and then when you're thinking about master's athletes, in the heat, there is that sex difference, especially after the onset of menopause where women have less heat tolerance. And it is things like um, pre-cooling by ingesting cool beverages, not icy beverages, but cool beverages to drop the core temperature, Um, a little bit of passive heat exposure. So you're going to go to the spa or you're gonna go to the sauna, just the same as I was describing before. But on race day itself, knowing that the cooler the stuff that you ingest, the better it is for you. And um, trying not to get sunburned. Because if you get sunburned, then your um, skin temperature is hot and your body perceives that as needing to throw more blood to the periphery. So many things. That was actually a very concise answer for a lot of a lot of things. I think a lot of good takeaways and then a lot of things I want to sort of jump off on. Um, the spa, just to confirm, is like a hot tub. Yep. Yeah. Um, is there yep. is there any like accepted ranges of temperatures for either the spa or the sauna, or like some sort of guideline for for people? Like, is like just your normal one um, good, or do you know? Is it? Yeah, yeah, your normal one. So, I mean, I'm thinking of metric because I always think metric. Well, we're in Canada, um, so you should when... be okay. I don't know if you can tell oh, from my A's, awesome. and, my A's, and whatnot. But... Yeah. My office mate is Canadian. I'm surrounded by Canadians. Oh, and I'm sure kid. they are a lovely uh, people. Yeah, so you probably they know are. them. Awesome. I, I, likely like 12, know, yeah. I likely know them. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so if you're thinking about um, a hot tub around 40 or 42 degrees C, um, trying to keep your palms and your feet submerged because you get a lot of um, temperature regulation through the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And, you know, when people start to get too hot in a, in a hot tub, they'll take one arm out and all of a sudden they feel cooler. Try to keep it in. Um, and then slowly rehydrate over the course of three or four hours once you get out so that you don't kill the, the dehydration sensation at, at the level of the kidney because you want that deoxygenation from dehydration so that your kidney goes, oh, we need to produce more red cells. We need to produce more plasma volume. Um, and then when you get to a sauna, you 
you know, 160 to 180 is the temperature range normally in a sauna. Start high and then, and then when you get too hot on the top level, move down to the bottom level so that you can actually spend more time in the sauna. Knowing that your resting heart rate might be 140 to 150 because it's such an intense heat stress, but that's what you want. It's a very hard session on the back of a training session. And again, slowly rehydrating over the course of three or four hours. Okay, and... That all sounds really unpleasant. Yeah, it's, it's almost... Yeah! Weird. I've done a bit of it, and it, it's definitely like mental training, for sure. Like, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to ju- jump yeah. in the tub for a soak. Yeah. Like, you're not... <laughs> no. Go for no. a steam. And, yeah, the first couple of times, like, if you're like, oh, I have to do this seven days in a row, the first two times, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is awful. But then it gets really bearable, because your body adapts that quickly. Okay. Um, and then the sunburn point, I, I remember getting in an argument with someone about sunscreen and I thought, you know, whatever, as far as the health effects long-term of, of sunscreen and sun exposure, but um, wearing sunscreen, is that potentially going to lower the temperature of the skin? Do you know anything about that? So it's, it's a bit funny. It's not necessarily the the temperature of the skin, the sunscreen, people often talk about, okay, if you use a zinc base, then you can't sweat very much because the it covers the pores, um, mm-hmm. which is one of the arguments. That and was then the if you're thinking, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and then if you're thinking about like a typical sunscreen, the waterproof kind, it's the same thing. When I say don't get sun, don't get sunburn, I'm thinking about using the UV protectant materials that are now available. Like, um, like a, a lot of the surf lifesavers down here where there's no ozone, um, they'll be wearing special rash guards that are very thin to keep them cool when they're on on land. But it's also made of the UV protectant materials. And you can get arm warmers that way. You can get shoulder protectors that way. Um, so those are some of the better ways of, of preventing sunburn. And then the other aspect about using materials is that you can pour cool water on your arm sleeves and um, on your jersey and stuff, and then that helps even remove more heat from the body. So it's kind of enabling a a, sort of a sweating mechanism um, because heat gravitates to where it's cold. Gotcha. Um, And then have you done anything with overdressing? I've seen a little bit lately about sort of overdressing as a way to sort of stimulate heat um, and with the pros and cons, I guess, of sweating and stuff. But I've seen that as a possible way to sort of prepare for a hotter environment. Um, And from a physiological change point of view, it doesn't. From a psychological sort of placebo, but not really because it does have a, a psychological benefit. You get used to feeling uncomfortable and sweating a lot. So the argument really is the placebo effect of that goes a very long way in being able to mentally cope with the heat. But from a physiological perspective, overdressing and trying to do like wind training sessions and stuff and with no fan and too many clothes on from a cardiovascular and a, a heat adaptation point of view, it doesn't do much. Okay. And then I've also seen a lot of this heat stuff now being applied to altitude. So maybe if we segue into mm-hmm. altitude, does a lot of this stuff, this, is it similar if we were, you know, preparing to go to Leadville, but, you know, we're down at sea level, would you still advise some of that same spa and sort of heat adaptation protocol? Yeah. So if we think about um, altitude, one of the, the, the issues there of someone going from sea level to altitude is the oxygen delivery, right? We There's just not enough oxygen. And if you think about what is happening when you are getting heat adapted, you get a total blood volume expansion. So you have more water in the blood, but you also have more red cells. So if you were to do some heat adaptation before you go to altitude, you're going to have blood volume expansion, which means you have more red cells to be able to deliver more oxygen, um, which helps in that lower oxygen standpoint. You also get dehydrated from an increased respiratory rate um, when you're at altitude and it increased carbohydrate usage when you're at altitude, that the increased plasma volume from the heat exposure gives you more total body water as well. So using strategies of dehydration and heat stress benefit when you go to altitude as well. Um, the aspect of doing a combination of like altitude training and heat together, those 
to overlay, it would you would assume or think that, okay, well, if I'm getting an altitude stimulus to increase my blood volume and red cells, and then I'm also getting a heat stimulus at the same time, it they don't actually marry up. You need to do one or the other. And the way that we think about it is you can do altitude first and then get into heat. But if you're limited and you don't have that kind of capability, then do the heat. Okay, that's great. Um, now for females, would there be any difference with altitude then? Is there a sex difference there? For how altitude exposure or when they actually go to altitude? Um, I think, yeah, in this case more like, let's say we have a female athlete, um, and she's going to go, you know, maybe not do heat stuff, but she is going to go to altitude. Um, you know, how would she prepare, um, you know, for this in the pre-menopausal? Yeah, so part of the aspect of of um, actually going to altitude is knowing where you are in your cycle. If you're in the high hormone phase before you go to altitude and you hit altitude in the high hormone phase, you are more predisposed to having asthmatic issues and respiratory distress because your respiratory drive is already elevated. And then when you go to altitude, it's a natural response to that low oxygen environment to increase your respiratory drive. The other aspect is the carbohydrate. When you go to altitude, because it is such a strong stress and everything is elevated from a metabolic standpoint, you go through more carbohydrate. And in the high hormone phase, you can't access carbohydrate very well. Your body's relying more on fat. So if you're going to do a hard training block and go to altitude, you have more of a predisposition to being overtrained. Um, the way, again, to mitigate that is doing that heat adaptation before you go to altitude. Um, one of the studies that we're doing right now is looking at when do you do the heat adaptation for women? Do you do it in the low hormone or the high hormone phase? What's going to benefit you the most before you actually go to that hot environment? Um, we're not quite done yet, so I can't really give you that answer, but it is something to consider. Would the In that case, though, would you run into an issue of timing or would you, you know, you know what I mean as far as like the heat adaptation, like the closeness to the altitude or, you know, if the cycle uh, we, didn't line up? Yeah. So if the cycle doesn't line up, you can do your, so let's say that doing your heat adaptation in the high hormone phase becomes the ideal uh, because you have threshold shifts that are already predisposing you to not do so well in the heat. So you want to stimulate those so you do better. Um, and say that high hormone phase comes two weeks before you're supposed to go. You do your acclimation during that, and then you can, quote, top up with heat exposure once every four to five days, and you can hold that adaptation. Okay, perfect, perfect. That's good to know. And that's that's a general thing as well, right? Like anyone can make yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So like timing and travel and stuff too. Like people are like, I don't have time to do this up to, you know, the general protocols, you want to do it seven, seven to nine days in a row, finishing four to five days before you hit the environment that you're adapting to. And people are like, well, for timing more purposes, I can't do that. So then you look where your calendar where it's going to be the least stressed, but the closest that you can make it, adapt there, do your um, acclimation there, and then top up across the board till you get there. Okay, and is there, again, altitude, in terms of altitude, is there, you know, if someone has pretty free schedule, you know, they could go the day before the race, they could go seven days before the race or 14 days, is there a general advice uh, from, from your experience there? Mm, yeah, if you have done no preparation for altitude, you need to fly in and fly out um, within 24 hours. You need to get in, do the race, and get out. Um, because there's that lag time that your body can still perform without the detrimental effects of altitude. Otherwise, you're looking at 14 to 21 days exposure before racing. A lot of people will go you know, three or four days before and then try to race, and that's the absolute worst time because your body is overstressed over those three to four days and bottoms out. Then it starts to come back up a little bit for that second week, by the end of the second week, you could probably perform, but the end of the third week is when you're going to have the best benefit. Right. And, and would there be, um, you know, in the absence of the heat train, but would there be individual, there'd obviously be individual difference in response time, I would think, within that sort of rough range? Yeah, yeah. If you've had any kind of um, altitude exposure before, 
and then you come back down to sea level, every time you go back up, your body adapts a little bit faster. So if it's an annual thing, then you'll notice that each year it gets a little bit better. Um, if you can go a couple few times a year, then the adaptation becomes even faster. So the lag time between your body understanding the stress and then adapting to it becomes shorter and shorter with subsequent altitude exposures. And what if someone lived in, you know, you know, California relatively well, I guess, like what if someone lived, you know, in like LA and could get up to Big Bear, you know, on the weekends for a day or two, you know, do some training up there. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that worthwhile, you know, in the months ahead of doing something like Leadville um, to do those sort of days up in the mountains? Yeah, if you could, could do like a couple of weekends up in the mountains with the riding aspect at that altitude, and then during the week hit some of the sauna sessions um, leading up to Leadville, because Leadville can be hot or cold and at altitude, so you're actually adapting for both. Um, the exposure on that one day in the mountains at Bear wouldn't give you all the adaptations that you want, but it's going to stimulate some of the um, the receptor sites and the adaptations that you want. So your body's going to be a little bit primed for that stress. That's why I'm saying you go, you ride one day, so you're not affected by the altitude, but your body is getting uh, a dose of that, that altitude. And then you come back down and you actually plan the heat exposure to get those adaptations. So it's a combination of where you are at sea level. Nice. Nice. Um, and then maybe the last thing on that would be, you know, the, the question that is as far as altitude tents and stuff like that, um, you know, are those worthwhile if it's within someone's, you know, price range and, and budget to, to sleep in an altitude tent or, or where are we at with that? Um, so altitude tents, they're hit or miss because when you're thinking about sleep quality um, and it's very interrupted in an altitude tent, you are losing so much of your recovery when you are not sleeping well. So your fitness adaptation suffers. So if does your you marriage. are trying to do just throwing that out yes. there. So does your marriage for sure. <laughs> for, the, for the record, um, I sold it before I met Molly. Uh, so there may be a correlation between meeting people and not having an uh -huh. altitude. I'm not sure. I haven't conducted the study on Perfect. that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Um, but if you're like solo and sleep with earplugs and can sleep through anything, then you could probably give an altitude tent to go for three or four weeks and get some benefit. But for the general person, the expense and the lack of sleep, not to mention the detriment on your marriage and or your partner, um, those negatives far outweigh trying to get into an altitude tent. Okay. It's better to try to do your heat exposure for the blood volume expansion instead of trying to fork out the cash and lose sleep and fitness adaptations with an altitude tent. Yeah, it's sort of those, we, we uh, get caught up in these, you know, 1% gains and often miss the, you know, that, that sleep and, you know, the quality of your training, right? Like we, you know, all this talk about altitude adaptation, but really, you know, being a fit, capable cyclist who is healthy going to Leadville is you know, that's a big portion. There's lots of people that show up and don't do any altitude preparation and they finish and, you know, are otherwise happy, yeah. right? Like that last 10% or 5% or whatever is not, you know, for the, a lot of us is not the, the piece that's missing often, right? Right, right. The two biggest things, the two biggest downfalls that people have when they're thinking about hitting Leadville without having the altitude adaptation um is they misstep in their nutrition because your nutritional needs change when you get to altitude because there is this increased reliance on carbohydrate and also an increased need for hydration. Um, and they also misjudge the sleep and recovery when they're at sea level. So if you could dial in the sleep and recovery, and by recovery I mean like nutrient timing so you don't have um, nutrition delay so that your body actually gets what it needs and keeps cortisol low, and you get into really good um, deep sleep for proper repair and recovery and growth hormone spikes. And then when you get to Leadville, your nutrition is mapped out for altitude. Those are the, the biggest impacts that you could have if you don't have the capability or feasibility to do some proper prep for altitude using heat and or altitude exposure. Great. Um, you mentioned cycle and the high 
portion of that cycle? Like, is there, how, how would someone go about tracking that? Like, is there a way you found works best or is most... This is back to the women's cycle for... Sorry, yes, I should yeah. say, the menstrual cycle. Yeah. Um, is there a way that you found is the most effective? And, and I guess I, I'm thinking about it from, like, a adherence standpoint even. Um, you know, mm-hmm. what, what what's the easiest, I guess, to sort of map that out so someone does understand, you know, when it is the high cycle and, and then how they feel and perform at that point? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of really fantastic um, apps that are out for menstrual cycle tracking. Uh, Sitter Woman is one that um, has been based on elite female athletes. And the other one is Hello Clue. And even Google has one that you can put in for, like, menstrual cycle tracking. And the biggest thing is um, tracking mood. Like, all of these have, like, how do you feel, What's the length of your cycle? So you input basic information, and then an algorithm will spit out when to expect your period. Um, and then over the course of the days, as you're seeing it on on the app, you can put in how you feel and how your training was, and then you can map that over your training, and you can start to see patterns over the course of two cycles. And you can say, oh, look at that. I'm five days out from when my period starts. I know I can't do this intensity session. So that you don't waste valuable training time trying to get adaptations that are not going to come because you can't hit the right intensities. So you can start to see these patterns and adapt some of your training so that on days you feel fantastic, you can go and do the high-intensity, really strong training stress to get adaptations. And on the days you don't feel that fantastic, then you know, okay, well, I'm just going to do a steady state and I'm going to, you know, just try to maintain or, or consolidate my training on these days. Okay, those are some great suggestions for sure. And, and do you see, like, are, are, there must be, some, again, individual difference as far as some people, this would be just a breakthrough for them and then other people, it's, it's not as, a, you know, big a deal to track it? Um, or, or do you, do you think you'd be that, surprised yeah you'd be surprised because they're so like you could ask so many women like where are you in your cycle most people are like uh not really sure and they leave a lot to chance when they don't know like they'll go and they'll say oh i have this track session tonight and i, I don't understand what's wrong with me what's going on I, and then they go through all these metrics of did i eat well did i sleep well but the simplest thing of tracking is going to give insight to all of these questions that people or women in particular ponder and go, is it, is it me? What's going on? And even if you kind of know where you are, if you're tracking, you do know. And so you can really start to get into the patterning of how your body responds to these hormone fluctuations that happen pretty much on a daily basis. Um, so I recommend everyone to track. Even if you kind of know where you are, it's better just to know. Yeah, it seems like something, you know, in this age of HRV and tracking resting heart rate and all this stuff that it seems like a a pretty important thing, right? You know, it doesn't sound like it's that complicated ultimately once you get into it here. And these apps sound like they're fairly enabled and stuff as far as tracking, you know, other metrics that we know are, you know, correlated with performance like mood and, and so forth. Yeah. And then even if you don't want to use an app, but you have access to training peaks, um, say your period starts, you like put a little notation day one and then you can go back over your training peaks and you can say, Oh, well that was day one. Where am I now? Um, you know, so it doesn't have to be this massive time investment. It's just could be one little note somewhere in your training peaks or your training log to let you know where you are. Um, and things like heart rate variability, there's a discernible sex difference because in the high hormone phase, resting heart rate is elevated. So the heart rate variability is different. Functional threshold power is also different in the high hormone phase. We're finding, about 8 to 10 watts lower in a high hormone versus a low hormone, which can actually impact your, your overall training. So if you're tracking and you can see these things, again, it helps with the patterning and the training. So you can dial things in to work to your advantage rather than hitting your head against the wall going, I don't understand why I'm not getting these adaptations. I don't understand why I don't feel well today. It's all about data. Yeah. For, yeah. Uh, and then feeling. Yeah. Some, 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 sometimes we want it to be too much about these random data points when we have, you know, some pretty effective yeah. data points, you know, that we could just have from our own experience. Like if I'm throwing things at your head, you can generally tell where I happen to be in mine. Yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, and Training Peaks definitely has like a menstrual tracking function in, or not function, but field in uh, the metrics windows. Um, and then also apps like we've talked, uh, to the creator of HRV for training a couple times now and, and their 
app also has a way to sort of in the morning sort of track when uh, you were, I guess, where you are, or whether you are menstruating yeah. in the app. So it, and it, it then sends to training peaks. So there's a lot of ways that that can get tracked and then also communicated with a coach if you're working with one as well, which is sort of the other piece to this, right, is, is that open conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it's not open, right, you know, if you have a, depending on age and stuff, that you take on a new athlete as a coach, it's very unusual in this day and age for a male coach to immediately say, where are you in your cycle? Like, usually it's, do you have a menstrual cycle or, you know, are you normal? And that's the end of the conversation. But tracking gives the woman the empowerment to be like, hey, I know I'm not going to have a fantastic training day today, so can we do something about it? So it doesn't have to be a full-blown conversation, like all the intricacies that might not be so um, comfortable, so to speak. Um, But it does give you that availability to communicate to your coach that you know that you're not going to do so great on on these certain days and you don't have to say my period starts today so i know i'm going to be shit you can be like oh you know i just know the next few days i'm going to be a bit flat um somewhat specific question but do you feel like it would be the difference of you know if the threshold's lower so say 10 watts is it adjusting the zones and carrying on with whatever's planned or do you feel like it's more taking easy days or you know skipping say high intensity altogether and doing endurance or something like that like do you feel like it's an a, a modification to whatever there is like a lower threshold or do you think it's a different workout um, I never want to say use the menstrual cycle as an excuse. I want people to understand so they can make modifications. Um, knowing that your FTP is 10 watts lower, but you have this training plan and you need to hit some intensities, putting in some more carbohydrate or making sure that you're using glucose tablets so that you have carbohydrate availability so you can hit those intensities. So it's not saying we need to modify or give you a day off because that doesn't necessarily help so much with the short-term goal of a race coming up. So there's some nutritional interventions you can do to help. But if you have the longer-term plan of, okay, we have six months to get there, then, yeah, you can modify your training so that you're not so tightly wound into these three weeks on, one week off. You can really work with your cycle to plan. We're going to do these power days on 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 the low hormone phase around ovulation when estrogen peaks and estrogen is very anabolic, we can do some really high intensity, really hard stress days. And then as we get five or so days out from our, or when the period starts, when the hormones can really interfere with mood and intensity, then maybe we dial it back and use that as their deload week. Yeah. So this gets me thinking because I remember like 10 years ago, the really popular thing was to, use birth control to then schedule your periods, you wouldn't have it around competition. So, I mean, kind of two parts. Mm -hmm. One would be, I think you're right, it makes sense to not use a period as an excuse because at some point you're probably going to be racing in that phase. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's it's not going to help you if you've taken every day off. But then the other is, yeah, where do you fall on that, like, old thing of like, oh, yeah, just, like, skip getting your, like, using the placebo pills for the week and you know, go into the next pack so you can time your period around your racing. Oh, I try to get every woman off the OCP if I can, (laughs) unless they need it for some kind of medical reason, like Mm -hmm. if you have endometriosis or PCOS and you need that estrogen dose. But more and more literature and studies are coming out showing that your adaptation to high intensity is blunted by as much as 11% when you're using those exogenous hormones. And it's not a real period either. It's a withdrawal bleed. And on the second day, sometimes the third day of the placebo pill, your estrogen levels are as high as the first trimester of pregnancy. So you're never really in a low hormone state. And then the other side is you, you, if you are using something to control your period, you can't keep track of what's going on. Like women sometimes fluctuate between these amenorrheic and missed periods and that's a sign that there's some kind of endocrine dysfunction so if you stop having your period then you know okay well i might not be eating enough i might not be timing my nutrition well because if you get into this amenorrheic state 
there's some really good data to show that there's this inverse in your in, in your profile mood state. So instead of having your mojo and your vigor to train, you're actually reversed. You're depressed. You're angry, and you're just like, I can't do anything. So being able to see where your cycle is and is it normal is going to give you again more performance potential. If you're taking a pill and masking it, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And actually racing when on, on your period is one of the best phases to be racing. A lot of women are taboo about it saying, oh, I've got my period. I can't race today. And it's one of the biggest confounding issues in young athletes when their period starts. I've had some athletes go, oh, I got my period. Does this mean I have to stop swimming or I have to stop cycling? I'm like, actually, no. Now this gives you some empowerment to be, okay, now I can train hard. It's not a taboo thing. It's when your hormones drop, you have less inflammation, you start bleeding. Eating, and this is when you can actually maximize your potential. So it's about an education piece as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so just for, we'll say, the males in the room, the low hormone state is when there's bleeding, but that's also mm-hmm. yep. where we would expect performance to be the highest? Yep, yep. So in a typical 28-day cycle, um, the first two weeks, you have low estrogen progesterone. We call this the follicular phase, the low hormone phase. And day one is the first day of bleeding. And around day 12 or 13, you have a surge in estrogen um, with ovulation. And then you get into this the high hormone phase where estrogen and progesterone start to go up. And then that's called the luteal or high hormone phase. Um, and that's where women are least like men when estrogen and progesterone are elevated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that's like where PMS is before the first day of the bleed. Yep. So you still have the really high hormones then. Right. Yep. And then women will talk about feeling fantastic the day before, the day of, or the day after their period starts. And this all has to do with how fast those hormones come down and how fast inflammation gets flushed out of the system because the bleeding is driven by an inflammation cycle. So that's why women, you know, they have a lower pain tolerance. They feel a bit bloated. Um, they might have, a, you know, increased predisposition to being overly hot or, or get injured. Um, all of this is an inflammation-driven cycle. So as soon as that inflammation drops, boom, your system's like, let's go, ready to go. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, we're, we're almost through here. We've kept you for a while, but I wanted to get to sort of the issue of fueling, um, I guess the athlete, but especially female athletes who... Um, are overweight, like slightly, or, or feel they're overweight, so they're then not fueling mm-hmm. at all. And sort of just, could you talk to us as if we were that that athlete, I guess, and, and explain sort of why fueling is going to help us lose weight or, or perform better, or both? I, guess. I think there's a lot of guys that need yeah. to hear this too. Yeah, well, that's... and that's what I mean. Like, I, I have the same yeah. issue with athletes who are males that I work <laughs> with as well, so... Uh, it just, but I, yeah. I, I can see where their brains are like, how is this going to work? Like, you want me to eat more? You want me to eat, you know, more fat? You want me to eat whatever? Um, how is this going to make right. me skinnier? Right, exactly. Um, so there's a new terminology, well, I shouldn't say new. It's been around for a while, but the press is starting to pick up on it, and it's called low energy availability, also called red S relative energy deficiency in sport and it affects both men and women but it's often touted as being the women's issue because in the past we've had like the female athlete triad where if you don't eat enough and you become amenorrheic then you have bone problems but all in all both male and female athletes can suffer from low energy availability so when we talk about energy availability you need enough food to keep your resting metabolic rate elevated um, and that's just basic function. So your um, breathing, your um, metabolic functions of digestion, your endocrine system, your testosterone, your estrogen, your progesterone, all of those things require a basic minimum calorie rate. And then when you start adding movement on top of that, so your daily activities, you need more calories. And then when you start adding training on top of that, you need more calories. So when people get into this energy deficient state, either purposely or not purposely, um, their body's metabolic rates 
And when your metabolic rate starts dropping, your body gets into a, quote, conservation mode. So you start putting on belly fat, you start feeling fatigued, you slow down, you don't sleep well. Um, men will experience a drop in testosterone. Women will start to experience menstru menstrual cycle dysfunction. Four days of being in low energy availability, you can start having some thyroid dysfunction, which also can contribute to problems with weight. So when we think about the ultimate answer is eat more, right? And people go, wait, no way. The whole idea of calorie in, calorie out, need to lose weight, I need to eat less. But in fact, they're not eating enough at the current time to support what they're doing. They're already in this energy deficient state. And just recently, I've been working with athletes who have I've had to upskill their energy intake by a thousand calories a day because they come in and they're eating as if they're not training. And they're like, but I'm eating 2,000 calories a day. I'm like, yeah, but you're burning a thousand to 2,000 calories in training. And over the course of the week, even a 500 calorie decrement is going to get you into these problems. So you don't have that top end speed because you can't get there. Your body's not going to let you. You can't adapt. So over the course of a month, slowly increasing calorie content, they don't gain weight. They lose weight. They put on lean mass. Their power to weight ratio comes up and then they start flying because they've increased their calorie content. And timing has a lot to do with it too because in... And we think about, you know, we're busy, we get up and we train like 6.30 to 8 in the morning and then boom, we have to go to work, we have to deal with the kids and we might have a delay of food by, you know, two, two hours or so. And we just completed a study looking at the sub-elite group, so not athletes that are sponsored and professional, but the group of athletes that are training really hard, they're winning their age group, they're representing on a world stage, but they're also working and they have families. And those athletes who had that delay of eating post-training, even if their calorie intake matched what they needed, they still started experiencing these symptoms of relative energy deficiency because their body stayed in this catabolic state for too long a point. So it's the nutrient timing as well as getting more calories on board to keep you healthy and to support your training. Then your body goes, sweet, I can lose the body fat. I can adapt to this training stress. I can sleep and recover. And at the end of the day, the whole reason we go training is to adapt to stress. And your body adapts to that stress so you become a fitter and better athlete. So if someone's trying to understand you know, the more calories are coming in, are they going to burn more calories because of all this? Like, you know, they're going to fidget more, they're going to be, you know, energetic in their workouts and during their day, you know, is that sort of the, the way to understand that? Or is there, you know, a hormonal level that we're, we're missing? Or like what, you know, if someone's trying to understand that, well, if I eat more, how am I going to, like, what is the, is it building muscle versus fat? Like, what is, how, how does someone what, understand What's that? going on, right? Yeah. Yeah, how do you understand it? Um, we need to have people not think calorie in, calorie out. That's a, a very archaic way of thinking. Um, in the obese population, yeah, we can think about calorie in, calorie out as a first course of action. But a protein calorie has a different effect on the body than a carbohydrate calorie, and a fat calorie has a different yet a different response again. So it becomes about nutrient density and the quality of the calories that are coming in. So if you're eating real food that's high in fiber and good protein and good macronutrient hit and higher overall calorie intake, your body's going to use all of that in its metabolic state. So that means it's using more calories to actually let your body process. So bringing those nutrient dense calories in allows your body to use them more effectively. But yeah, from a basic aspect, you are technically burning more because your body is using it instead of trying to store everything as fat. Okay. And, and certainly during workouts, you know, when we have these athletes that are doing, you know, harder workouts and workouts, you know, over that one hour, um, you know, the, the tendency seems to be to, you know, cut the calories from the workout so that it, cause it doesn't make sense to eat if you're going to lose weight not nearly as fun to eat on the ride when you could you know go crazy with ice cream at night yeah yeah so, but yeah. I, I think or you that's... delay all of your eating till the end yeah exactly but then their workouts end up being yeah. crummier right right exactly because then you're not gonna 
the whole idea about, uh, like I said, the whole idea of training is to stress your body, to overcome that stress, to get fitter and faster. If you can't hit those metrics in your training because you haven't fueled well, then you're not going to get the adaptations that you want. So it comes back down to why you're training, what is the session, how are you fueling for it? Because if you fuel for that training session and you recover from it, then you're going to adapt better and the other aspect of that is your hormone profile, your appetite hormones will also change. So at the end of the day, you're not craving ice cream, you're not craving chocolate, you're craving sugar because you fueled earlier for that stress and you don't get as hungry and your body isn't in this breakdown state as long. So everything over the course of the day evens out. Yeah, and I think that's where I have dove in with clients who have, you know, been doing this like super low, like find out, you know, okay, they're cutting a ton. Um, you know, it's usually that it's super clean for a day or maybe two days or maybe even a week, but then it's, you know, some sort of off the rails, like can't sustain this lifestyle. This is never happen, right? And it's yeah. sort of finding that middle ground, right, where we can train and be happy and continue. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fuel your exactly. ride. I guess. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Fuel your ride. Do the 80-20 rule where you're know, like 80% of the time you're spot on and 20% of the time you're like, I feel like having ice cream for dinner. Yeah, why not? You don't do it every night, right? right. But the problem becomes when it becomes every night. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, I'm so thankful. You know, we had covered a lot of ground today. Um, I think a lot of stuff there for the coaches that listen and then also for the athletes that listen. So, um, again, thank you for taking the time. I know it's tough here with time zones and stuff, but, uh, Stacey, we'll make sure that we yeah. link to all, all your books and social stuff and, and everything else. Yeah. Thanks. Great to connect and, and have a chat. Yeah, now seriously. it's your bedtime and my lunchtime. I know, right? Hey guys, before you go, we just wanted to have one quick word from our sponsor, Health IQ. Health IQ is a life insurance company that helps the consummate athlete like you save money on your life insurance. To find out more, you can check out healthiq.com slash C-A-P-O-D. That's C-A-P-O-D for all the details and to take a free quiz. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. To check out all of the show notes for this show, go to consummateathlete.com. And to follow along with our various adventures on the social medias, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash consummateathlete or follow me, Molly Herford, at Molly J. Herford on Twitter and Instagram. And I am at Peter Glassford on Twitter and Instagram. And if you could do us a huge favor and rate and review the podcast over on iTunes, that helps us bring on more guests, you know, get more episodes out and do more cool stuff. So we would be forever grateful. And if you're looking for coaching for endurance sport or just for health and wellness, uh, you can check out smartathlete.ca. And for amazing outdoor content, you can check out theoutdooredit.com. Aw, honey. And that's theoutdooredit.com for Molly Herford's writing and all things outdoors. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.